Okay. I, now we have not had a Zoom this year yet. And just some reminders, we um, we did more Zoom last year, but just for reminder for, and for those that are new uh, to doing our Zoom meetings, we still try to make these interactive, but please um, mute your microphone to help keep uh, background noise to a minimum. Keep your cameras on if you can. I love seeing your faces. It makes it feel like you're actually out there and not a black screen. Thanks, Angelica. I appreciate you turning it on. I know we've all got, you know, other things going on, but please try to um, limit distractions and avoid multitasking as well. Um, just want to welcome everyone. Um, we have a very full study club now. Um, most people are planning to be here, so I assume some, some people are still logging in and will be joining us. There will be lucky door prizes, just like when we meet in person. So please stay to the end of the meeting um, for the lucky door prizes at the end. Uh, so we are, as I said, at our fourth meeting for the year. We're actually at the halfway point. It's whizzing by. Um, and to begin, I'm going to give you all, please turn your cameras on. I'm actually going to divide you into breakout groups. I like it when these are interactive. Um, give you a chance, just like you would in person, to chat with each other. And so I am going to divide you up into three breakout groups. And you're going to play a game called Something in Common. Just kind of check in with each other as well. Um, so please take note because you won't have a slide when you're in the breakout to remind you. Um, I want you to come up with uh, three things that you have in common with your group. So something that you are grateful for, a color that you all agree that you're grateful for, a color that you all like, you don't have to love it, but something that you all like, and a food that you enjoy. Um, so I am going to break you out into breakout groups and give you three minutes just to chat, connect, and just um, play this game with me. And I'll, I'm assigning it automatically. So I'll see you back in, um, in three minutes. Have fun connecting with each other. You do have to accept the request to break out. So see you later. I'll see you on the other side.
Hey, Alyssa, good evening. Oh, there we go. Hi, how are you? Sorry I'm late. Oh, no, you're fine. It's fine. We're, we're having a little warm up activity, so you're all good. I know I accidentally hit leave group and I didn't mean to leave the group, but it's fine because it's almost done. <laughs> yeah, it is. Everybody's uh, starting to come back. So you're all good. Okay. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It looks like group three is already coming back. I can kind of see my screen. Group one and the chatters in the chatterers in group two are still in there talking. They have 14 seconds left. We'll bring them back in. Thank you all for turning on your uh, on your uh, cameras. I appreciate that. It's nice to see you. All right, welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much. Why don't we hear what? Uh, see if we've got similarities between the between the groups. Um, let's see. Room one, uh, Angelica. Your name is at the top of that list. I think that's you. Can you tell us what your group came up with? You might need to unmute just to make sure you're <clears throat> me there now can you hear me yes we can okay so our group family and spring both kind of came up of things we were uh, grateful for yes i am very grateful for spring right now too mm -hmm. um, if texas could stay like this forever yes it, it, happy it would thing. yeah we'd have five times the population is that <laughs> But um, and the, our most favorite color was black. Black. Mm -hmm. huh, it goes with everything, and it just goes with everything. It actually makes other colors even look fabulous. So, black. Wow, I, I would not have guessed that one. Yeah. All right, room two, Darcy. Your name is at the top of the list for room two. What about the food. Oh, food. Mexican food. Oh, Mexican food. Mexican food. Yes, <clears throat> we well, can't be from Texas and not enjoy Mexican food. All right, Dorothy, you're, would you mind being the spokesperson for your room? Looks like she we, might be. Uh, yes, we, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. I'm pulling. Okay, um, that we are grateful for family. We all like blue and tacos. There we go, some more Mexican and family's a winner. Yeah. And Allison, you're at the top of group, the room three. Tell me what you, you guys came up with. Well, same things, family. But we also said um, springtime for being uh -huh. grateful. And then for food, we said Tex Mex tacos. And then um, what was the other item? Oh, color. We decided to go with green for springtime. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Okay. So it seems like family and Mexican is pretty, uh, pretty important to us all. But anyway, I hope you had fun just saying hi to each other. That was the main reason for that. Um, get us all warmed up. It's Zoom, but I just want to make sure that we all feel connected as well for these sessions. Um, all right. So we've been collecting those questions and we've got one of the discussion questions to give to Dr. Bingham tonight. Uh, can patients lose bone just by clenching and grinding? So over to you, Dr. Bingham, make sure. Yeah, so out. the short answer is yes, but the there's a couple of qualifiers on that. So um, some of the qualifiers are if the occlusion or how the teeth come together is traumatic and there isn't enough bone to, to support the teeth, um, then there will be bone loss associated with that. But if someone has generalized, and usually that's in a more localized uh, fashion, if a tooth is really um, flared out to the buckle, and if the forces can't be trans transferred down the long axis of the tooth, then, then occlusion, clenching, and grinding can do that. But if it's typically, if all the teeth are aligned and or relatively aligned, can someone just lose bone by clinching and grinding? And the answer is no. Okay. Um, any questions on that? Okay, next question. What different techniques will be provided when I refer to a periodontist? 
And that is a great question. Um, and it, some of it has to do with um, how we manage periodontal disease. And so we will talk about that question a little bit later with, with respect to other things like soft tissue grafting or whatever, there'll be some discussion about, um, there'll be some discussion about techniques and stuff in subsequent um, study clubs. Um, I would like to encourage you, I need some more questions. So if you have a question and want to put it in the uh, chat room tonight or email it to me um, so we can get a few questions up our sleeve. Oh, some, was someone trying to ask another follow-up question? Okay. I am now going to welcome Katie Scarborough um, she is our guest speaker tonight, and she is a fellow hygienist from Pennsylvania. Um, her career changed course when she had a baby two years ago. I know you, many of you have tried to juggle kids in a career. Um, and so she is not working as a hygienist on a daily basis anymore, but continuing to work in dentistry um, through lunch and learn programs, both in person and on Zoom. And so she is joining us tonight as a representative from BioGaia and will be talking to us as about probiotics in periodontal therapy. So I am going to hand over to Katie now um, and she has her uh, set of slides. So I just give us a minute to swap screens. Uh, Katie, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen now. Wonderful. Great, perfect. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Thank you. Okay, great, perfect. Well, thank you so very much for having me today. I'm really excited to share with you some of the benefits of our probiotics that we have at BioGaia. I'm really excited that a lot of the probiotics are starting to move into the dental health space. I think that they have a lot of really great benefits for our patients as far as their oral health, but also their systemic health as well. So this is just an overview of everything that we're gonna talk about today. I promise it will not take anywhere near as long as it looks. And this is just a quick little introduction to our company. So BioGaia is actually a Swedish probiotic company and we have been in business for over 30 years. I'm proud to say that we are global front runners in probiotic science. At this point, we actually have over 250 clinical trials that have been done on our products. And if you have babies at home, you might already be familiar with our probiotic for colic. It's the number one recommended probiotic for infant colic. The product that we will be talking about today though is Prodentis, which is the first and most clinically studied probiotic within the oral health space. So this is a snapshot of the trials that we have done so far um, on our products. We are constantly having more trials done. None of these are in-house trials. They're all done by outside agencies. We have university studies as well. And we have studies on infants, toddlers, children, and adults as well. So we really have tons of great clinical data to back up the benefits of our products. So anytime that you talk about probiotics, I feel like it's very important to touch on the microbiota. And the microbiota is basically this collection of microorganisms that inhabits an environment. So in this case, we're obviously looking at the mouth with the oral microbiota. So having a balanced oral microbiota is essential for having an overall healthy mouth. As you know, everything really starts in the mouth. After the gut, the mouth is gonna be the place in the body that has the most amount of bacteria. That bacteria lives and grows within the oral biofilm. And that biofilm consists of proteins, bacteria, and polysaccharides, which all really come together to create a protective film that allows that bacteria to attach to each other as well as to a surface. They're present in both the saliva and in the plaque. So the microorganisms that are within our mouth naturally belong there and under normal circumstances, they don't cause us any problems. They, they just coexist with each other. Um, they're in symbiosis with us and symbiosis with each other. We start to see some inflammation and some other oral health issues when we have an overabundance of that pathogenic bacteria. So it's really about just trying to find a balance between the good and the bad bacteria as opposed to trying to kill all of it. So as hygienists and as other dental health professionals as well, you're really helping to take an active role in helping your patients to stay healthy with good oral hygiene and good oral health. 
You have the ability to amplify that process beyond just their hygiene appointments by helping them to continue to balance their oral microbiota at home by adding in beneficial bacteria with probiotics. So this is the World Health Organization's definition of probiotics. It is live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts confers a health benefit to the host. So there's really two key points right here. The first is going to be adequate amounts. You wanna make sure that you have the right amount of bacteria for whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. The second key point is going to be health benefit. And I feel like this is just key. You wanna make sure that you have a lot of really great dependable clinical data to back up the benefits of your product. If you don't have that clinical data, then you really just have bacteria. You don't actually have a probiotic. But if that's all, that's all that you want, you just want high numbers of unspecified bacteria, this could be one way to get it. However, that's not what we're going for here. We don't want just loads of bacteria without any data to back that up. We wanna make sure that whatever we're putting into our bodies or whatever we're recommending our patients to put into their bodies is really backed up by a lot of great clinical data. And the amount of bacteria that's within a product is not what determines how effective it is. Efficacy is dependent on the strain or the strains in a product as well as the clinically studied dosage. So in order to show beneficial effects, there has to be data that's done on that very specific strain of bacteria, not just on an umbrella of bacteria. So when we look at bacteria, we start broadly with a group. In this case, we're looking at lactic acid bacteria. Then we're gonna narrow it down to genus, further narrow it down to species, and finally to the strain. The clinical data showing health effects has to be on that very specific strain of bacteria in order to really show those great benefits. So I think that an easier way to explain this is to think about the different strains like you would think about different dog breeds. So for example, like you see right here, we have a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. They're both dogs, but individually they have very different characteristics. They perform very different tasks and they were also bred for very different purposes. So similarly, we have two strains of bacteria that make up the Prudentis product. These two strains are the same type. They're, they're both Lemos lactobacillus bacteria. However, they individually have very different characteristics and they perform very different tasks. So different strains of a specific species have very different probiotic properties and they also have very different effects. So we've actually isolated at BioGaia over 300 L. Reutery strains, um, but with all of our research that we've done, we've only identified health benefits in 10 of those strains thus far. So if you're looking at clinical data, you really have to be looking at the specific strain that's listed. And if you're looking at probiotics, it has to be that very specific strain that you're looking at because the different strain levels accomplish very different things. So right here is just a comparison of the BioGaia strains and how their studied efficacy relates to other popular strains that are found in other probiotic products. So the middle column are the strains that make up BioGaia prudentis. These strains are proven to show a high effect in gingivitis, periodontitis, and implantitis. They show a moderate effect in caries and a low effect in halitosis. Now, the strains that are on the right side of the screen, they make up other dental probiotics that aren't made by BioGuide. You probably wouldn't recommend these for gingivitis just because they haven't been studied in gingivitis. They do not show an effect in periodontitis. They do show a moderate effect in caries. Um, similar to the Prudentis product does as well. But I think that this is just a really nice, you know, explanation, a really nice reference to show why the specific strain levels really do matter. So these are the two strains that come together to make up the Prudentis product. These two strains are Lemus lactobacillus reutery DSM17938 and Lemus lactobacillus reutery ATCC PTA5289. Now, these two strains, they're both the L. reutery strains, but they are still very different. Um, 17938 was actually isolated from human breast milk, and it has, it has antimicrobial properties. It balances the microbiota by production of antimicrobial substances like reuterin, lactic acid, acetic acid, and exopolysaccharides. 5289 was actually isolated from human saliva. Um, interestingly enough, it was isolated from the saliva of this woman you see pictured right here. This little gal had absolutely horrible hygiene habits, but she had beautiful teeth and very healthy gums. So scientists decided to do some studies on her gums and on, on her saliva. So from her saliva, they were actually able to isolate this strain, which they further were able to prove to be the anti-inflammatory strain. 
So these two strains just come together to complement one another and also colonize in the gut to really get that systemic effect while balancing the microbiota in the mouth as well. And this slide is just a visual of how that Prudentis product really works. So in this first Petri dish, you can see just all that unrestricted bacterial growth. And in that second Petri dish, you can see those drops added in there. Those are Prudentis drops, and they're pushing the bad bacteria out of the way. That bacteria is fighting for physical space, and it's also fighting for nutrients. So I'm just going to get a little bit into some of the clinical data that we have to back up this product. So we have 63 completed clinical studies that have been done on the Prudentis product specifically. 48 of these studies are randomized, double-blind, blind, blind placebo-controlled studies. This is the gold standard of studies. Anytime that you're evaluating clinical data, this is ideally the type of study that you would like to be looking at. You can also see right here that we have studies that have been done within multiple indications. I won't speak on every study. That would be a lot longer than the time you wanna spend with me tonight, but I will touch on a couple of each of these indications. If it interests any of you to check out the full clinical studies, um, I can certainly have that sent over to you as well. It's all available on our website. So I'm gonna start out with talking about the studies that have been done on it for gingivitis. And for gingivitis, we have clinical studies that have shown positive effects on all of these listed markers. And here's a few of those gingivitis studies. I'm gonna start with talking about the one that's in the upper right. This study was actually conducted on pregnancy gingivitis. So in this specific study, we had 45 mamas who all had some pregnancy gingivitis. So they took two Prudentis lozenges a day for 44 days. Now, by the end of that 44 days, they had a significant reduction in their gingival index. This, I do also wanna mention that Prudentis is proven to be safe during pregnancy as well as while breastfeeding. The study that's over here on the left shows that there was a significant reduction of both the gingival index and the plaque index. So of the people who were participating in this study on day zero, 100% of them had moderate to severe gingivitis. You can see there's a few pictures of their mouths at that point. Um, by day 28 of this study, 58% of that group had actually moved into a mild grouping. So you can see a couple little updated pictures there just on how the inflammation was really reduced for these patients. So these patients went all the way from moderate to severe gingivitis to mild in just 28 days. That's a really great outcome. So those patients agrees you have who are, you know, they're trying their best, but they're still fighting some inflammation. They're brushing, they say that they're flossing, whether or not they actually are is a whole other story. But patients who are really trying, this is gonna be a really great addition to their home care routines to really just help them to reduce their inflammation. For periodontitis, we have clinical studies that have shown positive effects on all of these listed markers. And here's a few of these periodontitis studies. I'm gonna start with talking about the one that's in the upper right. This one's actually a meta-analysis of three different clinical studies. So I do wanna mention that for all three of these groups, they did have a scaling and root planing done first, and then they were either given a placebo drug or they were given the algoidary prodentis. So when they took a look at all of those probing pocket depths, two of those three studies really reached significance right away. That third study didn't quite get there until they started taking a look at some of those deeper pockets. And then they did find that there was a significant difference in those deeper pockets. That's when that third study also really reached significance. So in some cases, the deeper the pocket, the more of a benefit you're going to see because you have a better chance of closing off that pocket. It's the same thing with the attachment level. When you took a look at some of those deeper pockets, that's when all the studies really also reach significance. So definitely seeing some improvements here as well. Both groups did show improvements, but the group that had the alroitery showed significantly more improvements. The other study that's shown on the left of the screen right here showed that by the end of this, there were 82% fewer sites in need of surgery. So to start out, both groups in this had a scaling and root planning procedure. And then the second group was given two Prudentis lozenges a day for 12 weeks. The group that had the scaling and root planning procedure by itself did show some improvements, but the alroitery group showed significantly more improvement. For peri-implant mucositis and for implantitis, we have clinical studies that have shown positive effects on all of these listed markers. And here's a few of those um, peri-implant peri mucositis 
studies right here. So I'm going to start with pointing out this middle study. So for this specific study, all three of these groups had a non-surgical mechanical debridement to start out with. Group one only had the NSMD. Group two had the NSMD, and then they used two prudentis lozenges a day for 21 days. Then that third group, in conjunction with the NSMD, had a round of systemic antibiotics for seven days. So at three months, they took a look again, and the group that took the Prudentis had the most significant improvement in their pocket depths. The antibiotic group was in between, and the group that had the surgical debridement group by itself had the highest of those pocket depths. Now, antibiotics definitely play a role in preventing infection and in treating infection. I'm not suggesting at all that our product replace antibiotics by any stretch of the imagination. However, I do think that in some cases where you're using antibiotics for preventative measures, patients are wanting to take them less. So I think in cases like that, our product would be a really nice alternative. So as far as general oral health, we have clinical studies that have shown positive effects on all of these listed markers. So one way that BioGuy Prudentis is really working is just by reducing the overall pathogens. So for example, this middle graph right here shows that there was a significant reduction in the streptococcus mutants, which of course is that pathogen that's responsible for caries. We also have data that's been done on candida in the elderly. Um, candida is prevalent within the elderly population. And with this study, two thirds of the population had candida at baseline. By the end of the study, after using the Prudentis lozenges, only half of those patients had candida. So there was some improvement shown right there. My favorite study to share though, and I think one that just really speaks for itself is the one that's on the left side of the screen here. So for this study, we had 72 healthy Navy sailors who were all heading out to sea. They were not given any oral hygiene advice. They weren't given um, any hygiene treatment at all. They were just told to continue with what they're currently doing and add in two Prudentis lozenges a day for the time that they were gonna be at sea. So they came back 42 days later and we took a look again at their gums and there was a significant reduction in the gingival index. I'm sorry, the significant, it was a 66% reduction of their sites with bleeding on probing. So that's a really great result. So how do you recommend Prudentis to your patients? We recommend that for specific indications like gingivitis, peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis and caries, patients take one lozenge twice daily for one to three months. Now for more serious indications, we would recommend that a patient would take one lozenge twice daily for three to six months. An example of that would be a patient with significant periodontal involvement. Now you're the dental professionals, you're the ones seeing your patients you know, every three to six months, if not more often than that. So if you're taking a look in your patient's mouths and you're seeing improvements that you're happy with, they're getting to a point where you just wanna maintain where they're at, you can certainly recommend that sooner than that, they switch to a maintenance dosage. And the maintenance dosage is going to be just one lozenge, one time per day. That maintenance dosage is something that a patient can take indefinitely. Patients will get some great results as far as maintaining their oral health, but it's also gonna to continue to colonize in the gut to get that systemic effect as well and some of those probiotic benefits. So as far as our products, we do have two different delivery methods. We have lozenges and drops. The drops, and they do say baby on them, but they're not just for babies. Um, they're the same strain and same dosage as the lozenges are. Um, we just market them towards babies right now because you can also use them for teething reasons. So if you're using them for teething, you're just gonna do five drops one time per day. Um, and the drops are also unflavored. The lozenges come in apple and mint. The apple says kids on it, but again, adults can use that and they'll get the same strain, same benefit as they would using the mint, um, same dosage as well. If you're taking the lozenge, you just want to let it dissolve in your mouth for as long as you can. And if you get to the point where you want to chew it, that's going to be fine as well. Um, I did want to mention that for the apple, um, I really like that one just because it has xylitol as well. So that's a nice little added benefit in there. And again, all three of these products have the same strain and same dosage. So this is just a summary of everything that we went over today. If I can leave you with anything, it's really that the alroidary prudentis can restore the balance of the oral microbiota. And of course, the strain specificity really does matter. If patients are interested in purchasing our products, they are available over the counter. You can purchase them on Amazon. It's $23 for a bottle on Amazon. 
Um, they do sell them over the counter, like at drugstores and Target and Walmart as well. Um, patients can purchase directly through BioGaia. Uh, offices who really like to recommend our products can also just purchase them wholesale. For that, we do have wholesale pricing. Um, I believe wholesale pricing is around $17 a bottle, and typically offices will sell a bottle for $27. So that you know, it's a couple dollars more than on Amazon, but it just kind of makes it worth it for you to take up your shelf space um, and just a little convenience charge for the patients. I do also have offices that don't sell their products for a profit and they just sell it for the wholesale price um, just so that their patients can get the benefits. But that's it, that's all the information that I have for today. Thank you very much everyone for your time. Um, thank you very much for having me. I hope I didn't put everybody to sleep with all those studies. Does anyone have any questions at all for me about Prodentis? Do you use the products? Do I use the products? Yes. I do. I use, I use them just for maintenance. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that I've never had really inflammation. Um, I didn't run into any pregnancy gingivitis either, but I do use them for maintenance. And so does my, my husband and then my son uses the drops. So how does the drops help the children that are teething? Tell me how that works. So the strains that are within the product have like an anti-inflammatory effect. So if you take the drops and you just rub them into the gums, then it's an immediate relief um, for them from the inflammation. And would we say that it's the inflammation that's causes the discomfort to the kids or is that the tooth breaking through the skin? What would you uh, think? I guess it would just be the tooth breaking through the skin, but the strains that are in there just really help to reduce that pain for the children. So that's just, that's one of the, the benefits of that product. It's like an alternative use for it, but it's also used just to reduce inflammation as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as well as all those other benefits you would get from the lozenges too. So if we want copies of the, um, the studies, then we can either go to the BioGaia website, is that right? Yeah, they're all listed. They're listed on the website. I can also just email this, the link to, to you guys so that you have it and you can send it to the participants if you'd like to okay. take a look at those full clinical studies. Yeah, I would like that actually. Yeah, I can definitely. There were some, there were some there that, that I wasn't familiar with. I was familiar with uh, a couple of them, but not not all of them. There's, there's a lot. They're all going to be listed when you go to our website and they're constantly adding more as well. So there's a lot of really interesting ones to take a look at. That's great. Yeah. I'm curious of uh, amongst the hygienists, how many of you either have used probiotics or your office does, or is, I'm, I'm just curious to hear what people's uh, familiarity of probiotics and in, in your practice are. I did use the lozenges that y'all gave us last time. Okay. So, and they tasted good. I mean, they're just like minty, like breath mints basically is how I felt about them. Um, but yeah, the fact that they have the positive side effect is pretty cool for sure. That's good. Thanks, Allison. Anybody else? I was in a practice where we added the probiotics to our perio program that kind of went home with the patient at that time or something since we can't really follow how much, them. How much, like how, like what supply did you end up giving your, your um, patients? A bottle of it just kind of had that in the the fee, you know, with the kind of the kit yeah. that goes home to make sure they're taking their necessary and they can continue on with it. But that way, you know, they're going to be supporting themselves in this because it's also a systemic situation, not just on the outside, but that really seemed to get good results. So, so not only did you get it out, but you were able to see a difference from those patients that used the probiotics mm -hmm. versus those that didn't. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I did some research with probiotics and I was reading some medical journals and everybody talks about probiotics, but no one defines what a good one is. So I was reading some medical journals to find out what that definition is. And what I found was a minimum of 50 billion CFUs and at least 11 minimum strains. And it needs to either be shelf stable or live. What, what have you found? I haven't heard anything about that. I'm curious, um, you know, because I know that BioGaia said here today that that they their products only have uh, was it one or two strains? 
It's yeah, two. two. Yeah, two strains that are exclusive and patented to our company. Yeah. They are How shelf stable. I think that's another nice little um, benefit is that once you, if you purchase the bottle, if it's unopened, it's going to be good for two years. Once it's open, it has a shelf life of three months and it does not need to be refrigerated. How many CFUs are in it? I don't know the answer to that question. I could find out for you. Yeah. You know, when we do probiotics in the dental, we're not nutritionists. So I like the idea of just having something that focuses on the mouth because I think we can easily prescribe something like that or recommend that versus the one that's for the whole body, which is what I take. I've never done one personally just for the mouth, but patients who have a you know perio issue or, or are doing the perio path antibiotics, then you can easily, to me, comfortably add that without trying to cross over to the nutritionist line of accountability that I think we have to be careful with. I'm not, I'm, I disagree simply for the fact that a lot of people who have periodontitis and issues like that can have a acidic gut and they need to fix that too. So I think all of it needs to get fixed, not just the mouth. That's my opinion though. Yeah, I mean, that, that, those are, those are, those are interesting you. points. I mean, Katie, I know that, that BioGaia is, um, we've been talking about their oral benefits, but these products also benefit the gut as well, don't they? They do. There's some really great systemic benefits with BioGaia. That's one of the reasons that I really love it um, is that it really has all those great benefits. So when you're using it long-term, you're going to get those great benefits as far as maintaining your oral health but you also get those gut benefits as well. So I'm even though I take it on a daily basis, and I don't have issues with inflammation. I don't have to worry about, you know, I, I feel better with having that maintenance in my mouth and then I still get that colonizing in my gut as well. And I did wanna answer that question about the CFUs. Each capsule contains 5 billion CFUs of the l um, bacteria. I mean, you know, in, in, I imagine there aren't many others that have the depth and breadth of studies supporting their efficacy in dentistry. Is that right? Exactly. That's what really sets us completely apart from a lot of any other company that's out there is just the clinical data that we have and the amount that we're continuing to do um, and the amount of studies that we have done that, you know, again, they're not in-house studies. They're done by all outside sources. We have university studies as well. Um, it's a very well-renowned product. It's very popular in other countries as well. That's great. That's great. I have a, I have a question. How is it the do like the same dose is totally fine for an infant as well as like a 60 year old? I mean, just size wise, I feel like it doesn't make a lot of sense to have the same dosage provided to both. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, I can just say that it's the same dosage for both. And with all the research that we've done with all the clinical studies, we have studies that have been done on people of all ages and they have been with this same amount of bacteria. So I don't know, I, I don't know how else to answer that. That's something I could, I mean, I could ask the people at BioGaia, but I just know that that's, you know, that's all the studies that they've done. It's always been with that same amount of bacteria and those same strains. Okay. You know, it might not be a function of um, like we, there needs to be a certain number of bacteria from a threshold standpoint, but, you know, I, I imagine that, you know, and I'm not advocating this, but I imagine in part of their studies that they would have tested what dose is too much. And, you know, I, I wonder if, in their studies. I haven't read this, Alyssa, so I don't know for sure, but I just wonder that, you know, they found the sweet spot from uh, the dosing standpoint. I mean, when a baby's born, they don't have any bacteria in them, in their gut, in their mouth or anything. And then all of a sudden they end up getting bunches and bunches and bunches of it. So um, I, 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 don't know, I don't know how to answer that question. I think that, that that might be a good one for Katie to, if she is familiar or can point us into the direction of, you know, why is the infant the same as an adult? Um, that would be 
a good question then to get the answer to. Yeah, I'll see. I, I would like, like if you I'll email you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you, Katie. I, we really appreciate it. Thanks for okay. sharing. Thank you very much for having me today. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your night and enjoy your weekend. All righty. Take care. You thank too. you. Okay. We are going to switch screens now. Katie, could you? Um, I'm trying. Oh, it was my so computer was frozen screen. for a second. Okay. All right, thanks so much. You got a pretty kitchen, by the way. All right. So we are going to switch um, now over to antibiotics in dentistry. And so Dr. Bingham's going to take it over from here. So, you know, I, I felt like it was an important, or a nice addition, maybe not addition, but to talk about these things um, together. One is a probiotic, in, in essence, adding bacteria to uh, the mouth or to the gut. I thought that that was, and then the other part that we, we may be more familiar with is adding antibiotics as part of, as part of periodontal therapy. And, um, you know, historically, there has been a place for antibiotics in periodontal therapy. And in the former uh, periodontal classification, we would, the, the evidence for the use of antibiotics in aggressive periodontitis cases was, was strong. And um, the literature spoke about using a number of different antibiotics, but the antibiotics that are most frequently spoken about for aggressive periodontitis was amoxicillin and metronidazole. And, um, you know, one thing to no note about metronidazole is that it can cause nausea. So uh, you might want to either warn your patients because the pharmacist will warn the patient if they, if your dentist ends up using this regimen, well, uh, the pharmacist will make a point to talk about the use of metronidazole as part of your aggressive um, treatment. Now, so where with this former classification, can you go to the next one, Penny? Um, so what would aggressive be in the new classifications? You know, I, I said that it would be type three or type four, which is a moderate to advanced case of perio, but it would be the grade C, because if you remember from the new classification system, the, and I say new, it's been out for a number of years, but, um, and this is the one that, that's the most current, the grade C is fast progressing. So there isn't a whole lot of evidence or very little research with the use of this new classification. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm saying, well, if the, the disease is fast, pro, fast progressing, which would be grade C, then I'm going to equate that to what aggressive was in the former classification system. So essentially it would be the same protocol, amoxicillin, metronidazole, and um, that would be, now here's an interesting question. So, you know, there might be a number of you who as part of your treatment of periodontal disease will involve antibiotics. Now, if you're using antibiotics as part of your regimen, where does probiotics fit in the equation? Or can it? I think it's very important. And I think that you just have to make sure that they don't take the two in conjunction with one another. You need to make sure they're taking them hours apart so that you can help keep that healthy microflora, the good bugs. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I should have asked Katie about that because they're like what you say is is true because essentially the antibiotics does what? It anti, it kills bacteria and you're introducing bacteria into your system. And the question that maybe maybe Penny, if we could email Katie, and I think we, we did speak to her about this, um, 
but before, but I didn't quite, don't quite remember her response is, you know, you don't want to be adding one and then taking it away with the antibiotics. So I think you're exactly right, Angela, that, that you don't want them to be fighting each other. And she did reference in her presentation, the idea that when patients are, um, that they, that won't don't or don't want to take antibiotics, that maybe that's, you make it a probiotic exclusive regimen. You know, the science on that, I, I can't speak, can't speak to that. And I know that maybe in a number of your offices, um, you may, your office might be using antibiotics as, as in conjunction with scaling and root planing. So, I have a question that goes along with that. I was sure. wondering, even with um, oral antimicrobial rinses that are used every day, um, you know, everything down from the one that kills 98.9 that, you know, percent of germs in your mouth to, uh, you know, the prescription ones. I was, I was wondering the same thing, if that has a, a Yeah, effect. we did. We did ask Katie that in review of uh, her presentation. Penny, do you remember exactly what she said regarding that? Yes, I'm just I'm just double checking here. Um, so we actually give both of these. So we give the antimicrobial. We're going to go through it in a minute, and the probiotics to patients in their post-operative kit. And so the instructions are to wait. I think it's two hours between each. So do, you know, brush your teeth, do the antimicrobial, and then wait a couple of hours before doing the probiotics. So you can't take them at the same time. They're both beneficial, but you, you gotta manage how, how you're taking them. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Does that, did that answer your question, Angelica? I see her nodding her head. She's yes, gonna... yes, okay. I, I, had, I, knew, I knew myself, so, okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions about, about this? You know, so some other things that might want to consider too is when, when, when would you also want to include antibiotic uh, therapy? And, you know, one of the things that I would say is, is that with uncontrolled diabetes and patient maybe have an, um, a periodontal abscess or something and, and some treatment needs to be rendered before their diabetes gets uh or before things get really out of control, you might want to consider doing antibiotics with diabetic patients and even uncontrolled diabetics. Um, you know, some, some dentists and some, maybe even some of your offices would use scaling and root planing as because, or as a result of salivary testing that they've, you know, gone through the uh, different salivary tests for bacteria, you know, which, which specific periodontal pathogens and the, the concentrations or the amounts of periodontal pathogens that they have that, that sometimes these, um, the salivary test companies talk about the benefits of antibiotics. I know at least for us in our office that, that we really wanna be respectful of antibiotics and don't wanna be using them at every turn. You know, if I were to prescribe antibiotics for all scaling and root planings um, for most patients, um, I think that that, you know, like, again, I want to be respectful for antibiotics. And and do you guys, are you guys aware of what are the problems associated with antibiotic use? I mean, just me messing with the overall like gut flora, right? And then causing things like IBS or like other like gut issues. Yeah, there's a potential with most antibiotics to cause uh, C. difficile infections. And C. difficile is resistant to most of our commonly prescribed antibiotics. And then that can make, uh, that, that can be a life-threatening situation. That's one problem that can come from use of antibiotics. Other problems can become is that they become, um, you can have an allergic reaction. They can be working fine for you and then you have allergic reaction. Um, another one is, is that they stop having, a, uh, they stop being effective in both the treatment of periodontal disease and in other things. And it's been said that 
um, indiscriminate antibiotic use causes more deaths um, than maybe all of us realize. And so, again, I want to be really careful and mindful about how and when to prescribe antibiotics. And so I, for, for us in our office, we typically don't prescribe it for most scaling and root planning. The other parts that we might be talking about from an antibiotic standpoint is, is that necrotizing gingivitis or necrotizing periodontitis. Have many of you seen any cases of this? I don't have everybody's thing up. Has, has any, maybe BL has changed the question. Has anybody ever seen a case of this? Yes, Melissa. Yes, usually they're college students during finals. <laughs> yeah, they're usually healthy kids or healthy mm -hmm. young folks. And I've seen both on the gingivitis and the periodontitis. And what's the difference? The difference is, is that does it involve oh. the the bone and does it involve um, um, the ligament? You know, it can be just limited to the uh, gingiva tissue. And it looks like, like I often re recall seeing it in, in the pap papillary, papilla regions. And when it's there, it's extremely painful. Mm -hmm. And so we typically would do a debridement with probably with local anesthetic to, so that we can actually get in and debride the root surfaces. And then we would prescribe antibiotics. And then with the conjunction of that, that usually takes care of the, the, uh, the issue. But those are the, the times in which we use antibiotics. I'm curious, how many of your offices use antibiotics in conjunction or that it's, it's the default method of, um, maybe not the default method, but is, is part of the standard practice for treatment of, or with, with scaling and replaning? Do most of you use it work for that? We have. We don't, and we do the perio path. And if it recommends it, I'll discuss it with them, but I also help them look for other options and then use it as a backup. If we don't get the results you know, that we're needing, we should definitely address it, but do it with a lot of, you know, uh, care and skill and judgment on that one, like you say, with the probiotics and things, just to try different options for them first. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's great. Anybody else? Thanks, Irene. Um, uh, yeah, I have to agree. Um, I can probably count on two hands. I mean, we use it very limitedly, but uh, also in conjunction with the salivary testing. So you know what bugs you're up against anyway to know if antibiotics will even help. And then the report does give you the suggestion on the best antibiotic for those pathogens on that patient and the levels that they're at. But, but I've also seen some really incredible reduction, you know, in a severe case where, um, where it, it hands down made the difference between just root planning and, and, and adding the antibiotic therapy. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. And, you know, I'm, when I when I say kind of how we do things, I'm not necessarily saying that my way is the only way. And, and, and I'm I'm grateful for folks that do things similarly. I'm grateful for folks that do it differently. And and who am I to say that that there is the right way in treating things? And so, you know, like there are different ways to do things. And in someone's hands, it might be a different method and in other ways it might be something different. So. Any additional questions? Have, have we beat a dead horse? I know I didn't really speak about uh, Arrestin or Periochip. Um, I think I may have addressed this in the past, but typically in our office, we don't, like I, I was looking for it for the other day for a case and we don't even have that in our office. So, you know, I think yeah. it ends up going bad before I actually ever use it. <laughs> or expires. I mean, I shouldn't say bad, it, it expires. I just got to say one thing about Arrestin, though. Um, I've used it a lot, but I think the, the, the reason I had such good success with it is remembering that every 28 days, you need to be placing that again in that spot until it reduces and gets better. And <clears throat> I mean, it says that on the packaging that it lasts for 28 days. And I think most peri um, hygienists, 
place at one time and you come back in three months and no, it's not better because you, that's not the point. That's not the way it's supposed to have been used. And so um, when I was using it and placing it every 28 days and having the patient come back within 28 days and putting some more in and I probed to make, to see what the, you know, how it improved or not. And then I placed the, the arrest in, and then I had them come back another 28 days. And when I was doing it on a regular basis, my patients definitely improved with arrest in. That's great. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, thanks for sharing that because I guess you're the first hygienist I've heard of that actually has had success with it. So that's cool. That's good. Now, I just wanted to share, just spend a few minutes talking a bit, a little bit. Did, was I to do this, Penny, or was or was were you going to do this? No, you were. Okay. <laughs> We've gone through this a number of times, and I can't remember at which point you know I'm talking and and stuff. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about how we manage periodontal treatment in our office, and some of you who, with whom we work. You, as part of our letters that we send, we, we send a, a sheet describing how we do things. And so the, the way that it's divided up in our practice is that there's three phases, you know, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And we'll spend the next few minutes just sharing about how we, how we go about things. Penny, next one. And so one of the things that I think is really important in managing periodontal disease and, and or treating periodontal disease is that there has to be some objectives. And if you don't have objectives, I think it can get lost of what your goal is. If, if it's to get the scaling and root planning done, um, that's great. But what outcomes are you looking for? And for us, that these are the goals that we've decided are, are most important. And we know that, that part of scaling and the, benefit, the, the, the benefits that come from scaling and root planning are improved home care. If the patient doesn't do doesn't change their habits, then the outcomes are going to be very similar. I mean, how discouraging can it be when we spend all this time and energy, and we've gone over home care, and we see the patient again for a reevaluation, and it looks like they either had, you know, like they may not have seen their toothbrush enough or whatever, and and or how many patients have you come in and said, well, I brush my teeth four times a day, and I brush it fifteen minutes each time, and and, you know, like I get a lot of tartar on the backside of my bottom teeth. And, um, you know, what does that tell me? Or what does that tell you? It tells us that, that they still struggle. And I said, it's not the time you're spending. It's the technique. We got to just change a little bit of your technique. So, you know, at least for us, a patient doesn't necessarily get to move on to the next phase until we get um, patient getting home care. And then ideally, we'd love for all the probing depths that were deep to now not be deep. And we use that five millimeter threshold as the, the number that our, our goals are. And we also want to reduce gingival bleeding. Now, here's a, this, may, this next question that I'm asking you is, um, what is a better indicator of periodontal health or disease? Is it the presence of bleeding or is it the absence of bleeding? So when I say that, that bleeding is an indicator of disease and that the absence of bleeding is the indicator of, is, a, is that a better indicator of health? I would say no. If they smoke, they don't have to have bleeding. That's true. That's true. Let's, let's take the smokers out of the discussion. Just so you know, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but the literature is pretty clear that it's the absence of bleeding, actually, that is a better predictor of health than that the bleeding is an indicator of disease. And so that seems counterintuitive because we measure bleeding all the time. Um, but, you know, and, and, and I could review that article more closely, but, you know, like there isn't a standard pressure that's applied or, or whatever but we still use bleeding as an indicator. So you know those patients that have a ton of bleeding everywhere, that they're not doing a, a great, um, that, they, that, they are, that they may be struggling on their home care. So as you know, like we, we will typically do a debridement when calculus impedes 
accurate evaluation of probing depth. So if I'm in the lower anterior and I can't get a probe next to the tooth and the patient is going to start with a debridement. And I imagine many of you probably start that way um, is that you do a debridement first. And for us, we end up doing the debridement for about, you know, if it's a really heavy case, we'll do the debridement for an hour or two. And, you know, part of that is to make the scaling and root planning easier. Um, you know, like in my treatment presentation, I end up telling them, because I know if I'm not able to do that, then we'll end up saying, you're going to need to come back for three different appointments. And they go, what? Three different appointments to have your teeth cleaned? I'm go, yeah, because that's, that's how serious this is. And so we would start with the debridement and then we would do the scaling and root planing. And then we end up providing, um, give them a, a home care kit that includes a, a toothbrush and we go over instructions and we go, um, we may even introduce proxy brushes and super floss and, and all of the adjuncts that they need in order to get, get things going. And then after six weeks, we'll bring them back for a maintenance and a reevaluation again to see, did we achieve our objectives? Did we get a reduction? And it's not so much just a reduction. It's that is, are there, two, are, you know, and I was talking with our hygienist here the other day and the threshold for me is if there's single fives on one tooth in each quad that have a five, I'm not inclined to do surgery. But if the patient has three or four fives or sixes, then I'm more inclined to do that. Um, now, here's a question for y'all. Why, why is surgery considered in the treatment of periodontal disease? Because well, it, you end up having a visual where you don't know. I mean, without the visual uh, scope that you guys have for your hygienist, doing surgery is kind of the best way to get visual on some of the stuff that you're wanting to debride where, you know, otherwise it's just by feel essentially, or even guess at some yeah. instances. That's so. true. That's true. So access is one thing. How yeah. stable are deeper pockets? What do you mean? How stable are they? I'm, I'm saying so, unstable. Like, are, but... are, are six millimeter pockets going to be easier to maintain six millimeters or is the oh. three millimeter pockets going to be easier? No, to absolutely not. Yeah. Six millimeters is tough, tough, tough. It's, it's tough. And so part yeah. of the reason for surgery is yes, access to clean the root surface. But, you know, we often will describe in our office that the reason that we're doing this is when you have six, seven millimeter pockets, no one's toothbrush can go there. No one's floss can go there. And when they come see you guys, it's really difficult to keep things clean. I mean, our hygienist doesn't use the scope in a maintenance, but if they have to maintain a deep, deep spot, then that's going to be a really difficult thing to clean. And so the justification, at least in our office, why we consider surgery is, is that we know that it is easier to maintain a patient in three millimeter probing depths than it is in six or seven millimeter probing depths. And you may have all seen that anyway, but then that may have been sort of a, a question that, that I asked that um, was obvious, but it, the reason that we consider surgery is that we wanna take away the environment for the bacteria that, that caused the problems to not be able to have a party. I mean, I end up telling our patients that, that the reason that we're doing this is that we need to take now what's currently unaccessible below the gum and make it above the gum. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's why we do it. And, you know, the description of, well, what's the reason for surgery? And I describe it. I said, well, you know, I'll often use my hands in, in this sort of arrangement. I said, well, if I'm probing here, my hands represent bone level and I'm probing and it's shallow and it's shallow. The, the problem comes when the, there's a discrepancy in the bone height. And so that's what creates the deep probing depth. It's the discrepancy. Because if periodontal disease destroyed bone in a, in a linear fashion under all sites altogether, there would be no need for periodontal treatment. But the, different, the, the issue is, is, is the difference in the bone height. And so my choice is to always either, well, I need to make the bone levels the same. And I can do it one of two ways. And I always start this way. I say, I can either grow the bone back up to the level that it was. And then that means that the probing depths are all going to be shallow. Or I can take the probing depths that are high and make them down to close to the level. And I tell them that this is not six, seven millimeters. 
this is oftentimes just a millimeter or two and it can make a huge difference in the probing depths because it's this this difference in the bone height that make the 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 difference so i actually say so it's going to seem counterintuitive that you've had gum disease that destroy the bone and in surgery we actually will take a little bit away but the reason is is we've got to do that and then i go through and i talk with them about what the ramifications are both in the short term and the long term i said well you know like you you may be frustrated or you may be concerned that now you get more food caught between your teeth because why We've opened the embrasure spaces and when you mm -hmm. open the embrasure spaces, now we got places where the bread that they eat gets packed in or their meat or their vegetables or whatever gets all packed into these embrasure spaces. And so I say that's the objective is that we're trying to take away the environment. Now you have access to clean it and we're not packing deep periodontal pockets with food, but we're packing it with bacteria. And so that's often the language that I use and I'll tell them, you know, I go through and I'll tell them, well, hey, you've got, you know, like your gums and, and your teeth had a turtleneck on and now what I'm providing for your teeth is a turtle is a t shirt. So it's going to go from right here and now we're going to move it down here. So, um, you know, if and I, I jumped the gun here a little bit, but that's what I was talking about is that phase one where the idea is, is that we're, we're trying to minimize the area. And there might be some patients too that, that I look at them and I know that they're going to need surgery right from the very beginning. And I know that. Now, here's a question for you. Why would I take the patient through phase one scaling and root planing if I know they're going to need surgery anyway? To get their home care and their health to the best it could be so they'll be more successful with the surgeries you know, to kind of give them that added benefit that things are going to respond well. So, I mean, that's a biggie in my area is that I want their home care to be good. I have a difficulty for them, anybody to do surgery on anything if they're not in a healthy state to heal properly unless it's an emergency, which luckily we don't have too many of that in dentistry, but, you know, just really having them understand what it takes to maintain it. You see those shows on TV, those makeovers and, you know, they perio and they're redoing all their teeth and veneers and all that and sure enough they come back you know and it's the same problem you got to deal with the behavioral part of it too and help them understand what it takes to maintain it and take care of it i mean we yeah i mean thank you so much for saying that irene i mean it, like part of like much of what we do is behavior modification or helping a patient's modify their behavior i mean the last thing i want to do is to do surgery on someone and to come back and it looks like the same I mean, that's yeah. really depressing for me is, is that, you know, like I, I do surgery and I come back, reduce the probing depths. And then within three months, we're still in the same place. That's, that's depressing. I, I, I don't, I don't like to do that. And I'll give you an, another reason. And this is a surgical reason, but what are soft and squishy gums? What, what would you think that that would be from a surgery standpoint? Is that an easy, are soft and squishy gums easy to manipulate? No. No, I mean, you guys have all gone into the interproximal areas when they're soft and squishy gums. And um, can you imagine making an incision in that, trying to make it so that the, you know, you're pushing it away. And when you've got soft and squishy gums, you end up tearing the gum tissue. And it's just a, I mean, excuse the term, Penny, a bloody mess. <laughs> I mean, I say that because in Australia, by the way, using the term bloody is like a swear word. I remember saying that once in, with Penny's siblings, uh, Penny's sister around and you know they pulled me aside and said you know you got to be careful using that word here and um but you know here it's unfortunately it's not but it's a bloody mess and that's you know that's why the, the home care management is so so challenging and sometimes you know we even get patients that re are referred for me to see they had the scaling and root plane four days ago and i'm seeing them for their periodontal evaluation i'm like um you know so it looks like we'll have to bring you back and we're just going to Go over home care. I mean, I do the full exam and and all of that, but I know that in in a month's time, I'm going to have to do that exam again and and um, see that. So, you know, timing of things from a referral standpoint, you know, like I would say that if you ever were wondering, do your reevaluation, know what the patient is, and then send them on to us, and that would be a, a good way. Yeah. I really. But Jet I said uh, dentistry is literally a bloody mess. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I would echo that. <laughs> I found I feel like with implants because it really it it saddens me how many are failing, you know, and telling a patient you have to do it again for the second or third time, or that 
you know, and I would love to, I've worked at a prosthetic, but just say, I want to have that patient in my chair for a little while to kind of make sure we got the home care right. Because an implant's success really depends on occlusion, which I can't help much with, but the other one is home care and that they have a good, you know, system and a good routine going so that they can maintain it. And, you know, I just, I think there's a benefit there for implants to take more time on the home care prior to getting an implant. And then uh, Dr. Rain mentioned that she wants to do oral DNA path, a perio path on every patient before she sends them to a periodontist, which I think is fantastic. You know, why would you put an implant in a, you know, bacteria, a mouthful of bacteria that are breaking down the bone? So, you know, I think there's a great window there for hygienists to get out of the, you know, to the next level of the box of, of working with more implant patients and getting to see them first and doing some home care and maybe probiotics or whatever, but yeah, helping them out. I think, thank you for saying that. I think that that's great. That's great. So, I mean, I'm not sure if all of you have seen this, but we just wanted to show a video here of, you know, when we're in our initial, in our initial therapy, what, what some of the things we may see. Um, and um, Penny was just, for those that haven't seen it, was going to show uh, one of these videos. I'm not sure if this is one that y'all have seen or, it, and, and this, this video I'll say is not the best video that we have available, but um, we were trying to find things and we may have moved it around, but you can see the band of calculus that's present right there and that the piezo tip is, you know, going after, um, going after that, but it's, uh, and, you know, when I see this, this is only movements of like, these are the, the field on the, the camera size on this is probably only about, um, I would say maybe three millimeters. And so, no, maybe, maybe even less than that. So, you know, this is just really, really awesome stuff. At least I think it's awesome. And you can see it now, like the, the piezo is, is put in the right place and um, you know, getting all that calculus off and just, it's just. So that's, that's literally like a sheet of calculus, right? Like that is, is like, that is, not, that's okay. not just like a little bit. Okay. That's right. I was just double checking, make sure I was seeing what I was. Yeah, seeing. <laughs> that's exactly. Yeah. It's not just like a little fleck here. This is like a real, really wide, thick band of it. All right. Thanks, Penn. We're in two different computers in the same facility, so I'm not driving. So Penny's driving and I'm just providing some commentary as we go through. And so after scaling and root planing at each at each or at the first visit, we give all of our patients that have scaling root planing, we give them a Sonicare toothbrush. Um, and I have to tell you a funny story about that today. Well, I will tell you now. So we gave a patient, because all my surgical patients, either scaling and root planing or surgery patients, get a Sonicare toothbrush. And we gave it to him and he goes, uh, what's this? And I go, what's, you know, my team said it's a toothbrush. Dr. Bingham wants you to have it. And he goes, well, I just want a refund. <laughs> and he was, um, you know, like he was not wanting us giving us this. I've got a toothbrush. I don't want this one. I want the refund. And, and we had to tell him that we weren't charging you for any of it. And he, um, you know, we showed him a statement. There was no charge to it and there was nothing to refund. And he was really quite upset that we ended up giving him this toothbrush and that there was no dollars off of his treatment that could come from a toothbrush. He, I think he's probably one of the first patients that we've had that um, didn't want a free toothbrush. I mean, even patients that we found that patients that already have one will now have a gift to give someone. Yeah. So we often will include either a, a fresh juice or a protein shake. You know, they've been in our office for a couple of hours and we will give them um, their choice of a fresh juice that we get or a protein shake. And I will tell you to avoid sugar-free protein shakes. Those things are disgusting. 
um, we tried the keto one and we had all our team try it. And it was, it was like, my team looked like they were all going to be sick from ch trying it. So we found a good one now. And, and so our patients, as I said, either get the juice or the protein shake. And then we also will give them a couple of emergency vitamin C supplements that they can have with water and they can, uh, so that they can have that at home. We all know that vitamin C is, is helpful in the uh, formation of cell membranes. And then we'll also give them anti-oxy-fresh antimicrobial or antioxidant mouthwash and dental gel. And so we tell our patients as well that we want you to use your probiotics, but we want them to be used two hours after this um, thing. And, and you think about all of the things that we're asking our patients to do with, their, with respect to their hygiene. You know, their, their hygiene is really important. And so we go over with the toothbrush there, how to brush their teeth, what are techniques that they use to get the lingual surfaces of the mandibular molars, or how do they clean the lower incisors with, you know, and like, so we spent time on that and we spend, spend, um, you know, trying to give them the environment that will be conducive to healing. And then we also will give them a couple of week, two weeks supply of probiotics, which is one of the boxes that are available, but because we're asking them to use it one in the morning and one at night, that it goes through in a two week period. And we do encourage our patients to go on the Amazon and um, purchase them there. I, I, in our office, we don't sell any of this. I'm not gonna be involved in being a retailer. I just don't really like to be a part of it, but I wanna give the, the things that I know will be helpful for patients in, in improving things. And then we also will even give them over-the-counter ibuprofen and Dylanol and tell them how, how much to take and how frequently to take it. What we've seen is we've seen the need for surgery to go down by almost 50%. I think the exact number is about 42%. So patients that go through scaling and root planing, we don't need to do pocket reduction surgery like we used to, which I think is a wonderful thing. And, you know, when I think about, you know, there's a couple of, there, there, there might be folks out there that use laser as part of their scaling and root, uh, root planning regimen. Um, and, you know, you need to be, you need to follow the instructions of your, your dentist. I know for me, I didn't see any appreciable difference and it, it was uh, time consuming and it, it really wasn't. And there's a periolase that I ended up, that I was the only one able to use it at the intensities. And um, really what this meant now is, is that we've taken half of the patients that would be in my chair for surgery and we've put them in the chair of my hygienist. And I think about from a business standpoint, that allows me to do other things and patients get well without surgery. And so, you know, like we've just been really excited. I'm, I'm, and I'll, it'll be curious for us to see as we evaluate the use of probiotics to see if we can even up that percentage even more so that even fewer people need surgery. Because at the end of the day, no one says, oh man, I love, I love periodontal surgery. There was a patient of mine, he was a pediatrician. He came from out in Leander and he found me and he came to me. He was originally recommended to see a provider that does, that used the laser and he didn't want that because he didn't believe it. And so we did this scaling and root planing with the way that we do it. And then, then we took him to surgery and, and he let me know all through the process, this guy, and we've all had those patients, but this guy was not um, a happy camper. What he liked to do for his hobby is that he would fly to Europe and he'd be involved in racing cars. And he said, I had to be taken off. I couldn't even wear the mouth guard. It hurt so much to put this in. But, uh, but um, you know, we got him through his sensitive phase and, and all of that. And fortunately now he says, oh, I'm just so thankful for everything because at the end of the day, his breath, he says, my breath doesn't smell anymore. My mouth feels awesome, bet more than it ever does. And he's almost apologetic for how much grief he gave us for, for doing what we did. But um, anyway, that treating periodontal disease is not for the weary. No, that's not right. What I, that's not what I meant to say. It's not. It 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 is a. It can be a thankless, laborious job, and at times you wonder why we do things that we do. But for um, but we've also have a, a fair number, and this guy was one of the ones that didn't want it, and he ended up being really. Um, he really valued it. 
And so, you know, I, I think I spoke about this before, but our objectives uh, is to improve access for reducing those pockets. And I'll be honest with you, the difference, the reason that I'm able to, um, you know, more often than not, really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing osteoplasty and ostectomy because the shape of the bone is not favorable for bone grafting. I'm not going to put bone in a place that I know isn't going to be effective. And so most of the defects that we have that we treat are not defects amenable to regeneration. Um, so, and you know, I, I did talk a little bit about this. It has, it's generally bone recontouring. I do, I do scallop. Uh, I, in my incision, I also take away some soft tissue depending on how much uh, osteoplasty and ostectomy I'm, I'm anticipating doing. And if it's if it's amenable to a, a site is amenable, then I will do uh, bone re regeneration, and um, I'll take teeth out that that are poor to hopeless prognosis. Now, here's a question, and this is might be a little um, how good are the pros prognosticating systems in predicting tooth retention? For example. If a tooth has a, a poor prognosis, are we good at predicting the reten uh, the ability for that tooth to be retained in five years? Anybody want to stab a guess there? I would say no. Yeah, that's right. And that seems so strange. You know, like, well, prognosticating systems are used to say, well, is this tooth going to be effective? Are we going to be able to retain it? And what we found in these in these systems is that the poor prognosticating, like when we give a sign of tooth, a poor prognosis, and the criteria with which we do this are sometimes it's class one furcation involvement, sometimes it's class two furcation, sometimes it's percentage of bone loss, sometimes it's mobility, sometimes it's all of this. And when a tooth has a poor prognosis, we may deem it poor and we don't think that it, and by the way, progno, prognostic, prognosticating systems are only used for about five years. So we, we can give about five years. And just because a tooth has a poor prognosis doesn't mean that it can't or shouldn't be retained. Now, hopeless, prog, hopeless prognosis, are we good at predicting teeth with, that have a hopeless prognosis? It is more predictable when the hopeless prognosis following the criteria with which we give hopeless prognosis. But there are occasions when, and you, you may be, be aware of this, but when, when a tooth has been given a hopeless prognosis, uh, the patients refuse to have the tooth extracted. And how many times in five years do we end up seeing that those teeth still be retained? And there's still a fair number of hopeless teeth that, get, that are retained because the patient doesn't want to have them extracted. Now, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be extracted, but sometimes our hands are tied by virtue of what our patients um, are willing to, to do. And they may include antibiotics and then we'll often include a post-op phone call. And then at six weeks, they're coming in for the re-eval and um, we're, doing, we're doing a maintenance visit at six weeks, kind of like we do with initial therapy. Because we know that, and here's a question for y'all, why is it that we see patients on a three month recall? Why isn't it, why is it not four or five or six? Why is it not two? Any guesses? Sometimes insurance, unless you're not taking it. <laughs> I'm gonna say bacterial growth. Okay. So what we know is that at three months, if a patient isn't brushing their teeth, that we're more likely to be successful in ma successfully maintaining them, regardless of their home care at three months. And that, you know, like we've spent a lot of time talking about, a, 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 you know, changing people's behavior and that, but four months, you know, we may say, well, we need to bump up your frequency to four months, but the evidence isn't as clear on four months as it is on three months. And yes, it means another visit in the year for the patient, but three months, the, the, the evidence is much stronger on being able to control the environment of that periodontal patient. All right, next one, Penn. 
And so they get the same things that, you know, they get the fresh juice and shake right after surgery. They get the emergency. We also have chapstick. Um, they'll include proxy brushes. And if we're doing two sides of osteosurgery, we will uh, apply topical fluoride at that appointment on the sensitive side so that they can continue on um, trying to address the sensitivity that comes with the procedure from with what we did. And then they get the Axe OxyFresh uh, microbial gel and um, add their first dose of Advil and Tylenol. And then next one, Penn. And so then if, if we've got them to the place that we want them to, then we place them in maintenance. And typically we like to alternate every three months. And the way that I'll tell my patients this is that, you know, we often look at the same things, but we often look for different things. And I think that it's really valuable for patients to know that they're going to have two or four different people keeping an eye on them, right? So it's the dentist and the hygienist, and it's the periodontist and the hygienist at the periodontist office. And so by combining that, they go, does it ever hurt to have more eyes looking at a problem? I say, no, it never does. You know, there are things that, that my hygienist sees that I don't see, and there are things that I see that she may not see. And then the same, I think, can be, you know, said for, for you know, maybe how y'all practice as well. And so it's really, it's really incredible when teams are able to be synergistic and be able to collaborate well. And so, you know, one of the things that we do talk about as well is that how important it is to have a healthy diet and making lifestyle choices for overall good health. I think because we're in the trenches of treating periodontal disease, we talk about systemic health all the time. We talk about healthy diet all the time. We talk about diabetes all the time. And so, you know, like this is how we treat periodontal disease in our office. It's, you know, like I start saying and says, you know, when I start saying my team's already doing what they need to do and getting everything going. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been, it's been good. One thing I have to tell you this, that I've been doing this for, for some time and my team put me in my place this last week. And I didn't realize how I said something was condescending. And I didn't realize it. And I wasn't even plan like I wasn't even doing it to like I like I was doing it from oftentimes the questions, and I don't want to be going over things that patients already know. I want to be respectful of people's time. And so that was the place that I was coming from. And when I sometimes I ask, well, do you know what causes periodontal disease? That can put patients on a, on the spot. And I didn't realize that. And so I have to have my team is, you know, working with me on on. Um, how do I have that conversation? And they said, well, we'll ask the question. And then when we do this, when we come into the room, you'll already know if they know per about periodontal diseases or not. And so that was, that was really good. And that, 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 that's the kind of collaboration that I think is really wonderful is, is that my team saw things, something that I didn't know. I was coming from a place of being respectful of time, but how I was phrasing the question was, could be viewed as condescending and, and, um, disrespectful. So, you know, let's go back one there, Penny. We have some exceptions. So a patient may never be a candidate for home, for surgery if they can't get their plaque under 30%. They're just not going to be there. We put them in a compromised maintenance and we're going to say, you know, you need that. If their diabetes is uncontrolled, we're not going to be doing surgery on them. Um, you know, if, if they can't have surgery, then we're not going to be doing that either. And then also, you know, if their blood pressure, as we've talked about a number of times about that. So any questions on this, y'all? Can you go back to that last slide for a second? That sure. one? I didn't look at that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to catch those numbers. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Penny, I think it's back to you. Yeah, time to wrap it up. If I was in the room with you, I'd be saying time out, Dr. Bingham. <laughs> All right, we're gonna wrap up now, everyone. So thanks for um, being on tonight and um, 
hopefully you got some um, good information out of the session. Um, our next hygiene study club meeting, so we're not having one in May because we are actually going to France, so we're giving ourselves a month off. Um, we are meeting again in June. This is one you will not want to miss. Ergonomics and the dental hygienist. We are bringing in a hygienist who is a personal trainer and ergonomics specialist. Um, to speak. She's coming out from California. So that's going to be a really good one. It will be a longer meeting too. It's going to be from 6 to 8 p.m. So let's just get the lucky door prizes wrapped up and everyone can get on their way. Um, thanks for, for being here. So I've got two tonight. Reaching in my lucky door prize back. So the first one is Sonia. Sonia, is you still on? She's still here. Yes, I'm here. Okay, you're the winner winner. Thank you. So, and the next one is Kendra. Are you still on here, Kendra? If Kendra's not on, I get to go pick another one. I think we lost Kendra at some point. Okay, let's try again. Irene, you're in. Yay, thank you. Um, so I am going to give you a choice and I'll email you. You can uh, email me back later, but you can either choose between um, an Amazon gift card or coming into our office and having our hygienist, Sonia, use the GBT um, on you and get a hygiene appointment. So um, yeah. I will uh, email you and, uh, and you can let me know which one you prefer. I know sometimes it's hard for hygienists to... Um, to fit in their, their own um, appointment. So anyway, yeah. thank you everyone for being here this evening um, and have a great rest of your evening. I'll be sending out the CE certificates in the next uh, week or so. All right, take care everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye, Angie. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>